This talk is about the oceans, and, and I want to start off by making a pitch for the idea that we should call this planet ocean, not planet Earth. This is actually something Arthur C. Clarke noted many years ago uh, when he said how inappropriate to call this planet Earth when it is quite clearly ocean. And these are actually some projections that just sort of, that show a more ocean-centric view of the world. And as you can see, it really is quite blue. One of the points that I want to start off by making is that I think it's really a great time to study marine life. And uh, there are a whole, whole variety of reasons for this. Uh, for starters, I think there's a lot of good news. And a lot of what we hear about the oceans is not so positive. But in fact, there are a lot of brand new tools. There are a lot of new discoveries that are very exciting. And I think there are a lot of new opportunities for ocean research that we really need to grasp uh, because the oceans are so very important in our lives and, and play such a critical role in the health of this planet. The bad news is that the oceans are changing. There are a lot of issues that we are concerned about. Uh, these issues operate on a whole variety of scales from uh, very small coastal areas all the way to the global ocean. And these things vary from things such as habitat loss and changes in, um, in pollution input and, and fishing impacts that often uh, stretch over broader and broader areas over time. But looking to the future, there are in fact greater concerns uh, about the potential effects that climate change will have on ocean circulation, ocean temperature, and even ocean acidification. And so when we think about the near shore all the way out to the open ocean, and in Canada when we think about the temperate environment all the way to the Arctic, we need to think about some of these threats and what they're likely to do to the oceans and the way that they work. Now, I actually grew up in, in Newfoundland, and I can remember as a child going out fishing with my grandfather, and we would collect um, fish, often cod jigging, and I was very impressed at the size of these fish. Now, this is not me. Uh, this is actually a child in Battle Harbor, Labrador, and it's around 1911. But the reason I put the figure up here is to illustrate that these fish simply do not exist anymore. And in fact, they really didn't exist even when I was a child. And this illustrates the point that one of the things that we face with the oceans is changing baselines. What we think of as the norm is really not the norm. The oceans have changed quite a bit, and a lot of that change took place even before you and I were born. Some of you are probably familiar with the effect of the uh, cod collapse in Newfoundland. Uh, some uh, 20,000 people were thrown overnight, thrown un uh, into unemployment overnight. Uh, and that fishery still has, for the most part, not recovered. And that was 1992. Uh, so it's been a very long time uh, without recovery. This is pretty ironic when you think in terms of John Cabot and his descriptions of being able to um, actually throw a bucket over the side of his ship and scoop up plentiful cod. Whereas nowadays, uh, they really are, are, in fact, in some areas, uh, being considered for endangered status. One other little anecdote I want to um, uh, share with you about coastal Newfoundland is walrus. And uh, I actually grew up, as I said, in Newfoundland. And I've studied Newfoundland waters uh, for many years. And I did not realize that we once had walrus. And I didn't realize this until I saw a talk Ransom Myers, a very well-known fishery scientist, gave. Um, about 15 years ago. Ransom is no longer with us, unfortunately. But he mentioned this fact that we, this is another species that we hunted to extinction. And so this is another scenario of a changing baseline where I didn't realize that we really ought to have walrus in those waters, but we really don't anymore because, because we hunted them out. So the Census of Marine Life, uh, as you heard in the video, is a 10-year program to understand the diversity, distribution, and abundance of life in the global oceans. And it was organized into 17 different projects. 14 of these were uh, primarily field-oriented, and three other ones were more synthesis in their nature. There were some 2,700 scientists uh, from 80 nations, more than 80 nations, uh, engaged in this activity, which really covered uh, pole to pole, tropics uh, um, in between, and, and the open ocean all the way to the shoreline. Now, it's very hard to discern the detail on this image of all the different projects, but many of them were truly global in scale. And the reason they were able to do this was through collaboration, uh, cooperation, and coordination. And so as a result, it created a truly global, intercomparable data set uh, that gave us a, a really global view of life in the oceans. Uh, the census dealt with the past, present, and the future. And so if we look to the ocean's past, uh, I find this, this image up here really striking. This is actually from uh, Santa Barbara in California. These are uh, abalone shells. And you can see that this is a species which, by the way, now is, is, is endangered in many areas, uh, and yet was in such abundance that these shells were able to uh, create veritable mountains uh, that these uh, merchants were walking over. The picture to the right, uh, I guess your left, is uh, actually in Denmark. And what you see here is bluefin tuna. And in fact, one does not find bluefin tuna in the North Sea anymore because they have been fished out. And yet at that time, this is probably um, uh, shortly before World War II, 
they were so plentiful that they could fish, uh, fill the, the floors of this fish market. Now when we look to the oceans present, uh, what we see out there today, the news is both good and bad. And so we still see uh, spectacular vistas, for example, on coral reefs. But the image that you see there of the garbage is actually a bottom trawl from the Mediterranean Sea. And in this trawl, they collected more garbage specimens than they did animal specimens. And this is from the deep ocean, so it's not like it's along the shoreline. And so we are clearly having very negative effects on life in the ocean and on the diversity of habitats that we find in the oceans. Now, if we think about the ocean's future, of course, we can't really predict what's going to happen. But towards the end of the talk, I'll give you some ideas on what I think is likely to happen and, uh, and, and why that's both good and bad. So one of the key things that's happening to all of us, uh, not just those of us who study the oceans, is changing technology. And so what I have up here are two images. The background image is actually the bathymetry uh, of the bottom of the ocean. And you can see it's extraordinarily detailed. You see lots of little mountains and ridges. Um, and of course the continental shelves that, that border all of the continents. The inset is a photographic uh, satellite image of chlorophyll abundance in the ocean. And so what it shows us is the complexity of surface waters and the productivity of these plants that actually drive the whole food web of the ocean. Now I bring this up because really the starting point for modern oceanography was something called the Challenger Expedition. And this was a four-year expedition from 1872 through 1876 that sailed around the world and collected uh, samples from all over the world, from the deepest waters to the shallowest waters, and gave us our first truly global perspective. But at the time the Challenger expedition went out, the idea of being able to visualize phytoplankton blooms on the bottom of the ocean were unknowable. They just could not have envisioned the sort of technologies that we have available to us today. And so what was once unknowable has now become uh, either known or perhaps unknown, but potentially something that we could know because we have the, the technologies to do so. And so I think as scientists, one of the things that we need to focus on is the unknown because there are still unknowables. And I would say one of the unknowables to me, which I find very sad, is that in my lifetime, we will not know how many species there are in the ocean. We can estimate it and we'll get better and better estimates, but we will never know accurately, uh, certainly not in my lifetime. So the census involved many nations, shown here in the sort of yellowish color. Uh, clearly it reflects the fact that there is science capacity issues in some areas of the world that are greater than in other areas. But all nations were welcome to come on board, and we certainly tried to encourage everybody who was interested to become involved. But we still achieved pretty good global coverage, except for some areas um, around Africa. Now, if we look at oceans present and the sort of technologies that we have, many of you are probably familiar with satellites. And satellites give us these wonderful images, both of what we see on land, but what you see in this particular image is, again, the productivity of the ocean seen at a global scale. So this has actually really revolutionized oceanography and our understanding of the oceans since it really became available in the 1970s. But these satellites do not see deeply. They see widely, but really penetrate only a few meters at, at best. And so for most of the life in the ocean, they really don't help us because they don't see deeply enough. Now one of the key findings of the census, and it's one of the ones that's really captured the public's imagination and the press's uh, interest, is the discovery of new species. And so I keep calling this the riot of species because there are just so many of them. And so in a typical year, we find on average 1,654 new marine species, and that's every year. And in the last few years of the census, that went up several hundred per year. And it involves a variety of things, from fishes all the way down to smaller things that may be less familiar to you. But nonetheless, lots and lots of new species. So four to five new species discovered every single day, even for hydrothermal vent environments, which many of you have probably seen on nature shows, there's a new species every two weeks. 